There is such a wealth of material in those passages that I don't even really hardly know where to begin. Last week we talked about the key to Adventist faith, the resurrection hope. We continue in our, our thoughts about that, moving from the resurrection as a key to you know, Adventist thinking, uh, the second coming and resurrection for um, our own theological purposes to the basis of hope itself and a grounding of our faith. And so there are a couple of ways, a number of ways actually, we could look at the texts before us this morning and interpret them in ways that would be helpful to us as we think about that. Mostly what I want to do is try to ground us again, ground us in the word and the story that gives rise to the thinking and the hope that we have. Excuse me. It's a weird sort of thing, a beam me up sort of uh, idea, beam me up Scotty kind of thought, that Jesus is resurrected and just sort of appears to the disciples. Any of you uh, Star Trek fans out there? One, two, three. This is a, I, you're a remarkable group. No televisions. I, I'm gonna, how many of you own a television? I'm guessing I'm only going to see two or three hands. No, I see more hands. Okay. Uh, anybody know what Star Trek was? Anybody who doesn't? Okay, good. We're all from this planet. That's, that's really important to establish. Um, Star Trek was this uh, incredible visionary show uh, that ran in the, uh, what, 60s and 70s. And Captain Kirk was this kind of quick-to-the-fists kind of guy who uh, uh, liked to fight aliens and whatnot. But it was visionary in its day because you had, if you think about it, a crew comprising a very interesting group of people. It was diverse. And in an era in which that wasn't the case, there were still people pocketed in homogeneous groups everywhere. Uh, that was remarkable. You see, the Japanese were still hated for what they'd done in World War II. And you had a Japanese uh, person on board. Martin Luther King was doing his work in the 60s. And you not only had a, an African-American, you had a black African-American woman on board. A woman. woman. Wow. That's right. That's right. So we're preaching the gospel of inclusivity through Star Trek right now, you see. <laughs> but I just raise this because there's this transporter thing that takes people from the ground up to the spaceship, wherever they're hovering over, wherever they've gone. And people sort of vaporize and then reappear wherever they're supposed to reappear. And that's what I think of every time I think of Jesus just showing up among the disciples. He just materializes among them. The door is locked. There's no way he's coming through the door. And he's there. And he's not just there as some ghost. Because Didymus says, listen, unless I put my fingers in his nail holes, and then my hand in his side, I'm not buying. I'm not buying. Thomas the doubter. God bless him because he saved us from having to say that. You know that? That's what we would have said. Well, how do we really know? I mean, he just appears. How do we know it wasn't a ghost, an aberration? Thomas saves us from that. We owe him a debt. We would have wanted to know the same thing ourselves. And so Thomas checks this Jesus among them and finds that indeed he is bone and flesh. He's the crucified and resurrected Lord. Thomas stands then as a very important witness to what took place. And the fact that Jesus just appears speaks to the mystery of a body that's been glorified. The now and the not yet. The where we are in the process and the where we will be someday. Right now we live in resurrection hope. Yes? yes. 
Right now, the resurrection is a certainty because of the historical record, which we're going to get to, of Jesus' own resurrection. That's important. And yet, I don't know of people, well, at least very many, I've heard of one story, but I don't know of resurrections taking place much today. Certainly not resurrections to a glorified body, an incorruptible body. And the Advent hope is in part not just looking backward to Jesus coming as the Messiah to save us, but it's looking forward to the consummation and the glorification. That is to say, it's looking forward to the time when Jesus comes again and takes us to be with him, those living and those dead, resurrecting them, calling them forth from their graves that we might all live together with him forever. That's part, major part, of Adventist hope. So this is part of why I said this was key last week, and today we have a little more time to look at this. Now, my wife's story is um, in John 21, and it's part of the record that goes to Jesus' resurrection, and I won't spend much time there, but I think it's remarkable because it's Jesus at the shoreline. This, this part was not quite included in the story for time reasons, I'm sure, but Jesus hollers out to these men in the boat and says, My friends, haven't you any fish? They're back at fishing all night long now, and uh, no fish. And Jesus yells at them, Why don't you try casting your net on the other side of the boat? I don't know what stirred in them. Maybe they had a vague recollection of uh, Jesus doing this kind of thing before. They, they should have said, you, you, you moron, what difference would it make? But they decided to cast their net on the other side of the boat. And I love the specificity of, of Scripture. It says they caught 153 large fish. Now, I'm pretty sure that's a literal number because it's not a multiple of 12. It's not a multiple of 3. Well, maybe it is. It's not a multiple of... Uh, uh, it's not 144, it's not 40 days and 40 nights, it's 153. It's kind of a weird, specific number. And it says they were large fish. And then he's offering them breakfast of roast fish and bread at the, at the shore. And they dare not ask. They know who it is, but they dare not say. Can you imagine how awkward that is? You're eating with the master, and yet you can't say, are you the master? Because you're going to look like a fool if you ask the question. And yet the whole time you're sitting there going, how can this be? How can this be? How can this be? How can this be? What a wonderful story. Come and have breakfast. None of them said, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciple after, disciples after he was raised from the dead. The third time. So backing up to chapter 20, where we left off in the gospel reading, let's just take a quick look at this story. Jesus appears to his disciples. Now, just before, Jesus has appeared out of the empty tomb to Mary Magdalene. And in verse 19, where our reading started, the disciples are gathered together. It said, the doors are locked. And Jesus came and stood among them and said his classic greeting, peace be with you, shalom. After this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed, it says. Again, Jesus said, Shalom. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. Now we go from identification of the risen Lord and a celebration of that in one sentence to a theological significance. My life was spent as one being sent, Jesus said. And now you who follow me will be sent as I was sent. He breathed on them. What an odd thing to do. But he breathed on them. And it says, with this, he, he said the words, receive the Holy Spirit. And then it goes even into stranger places. It says, if you forgive the sins of anyone, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. What an odd authority Jesus is now passing on. 
So in just a couple of sentences, Jesus makes his presence known. He wishes them twice the peace of God be with them. He reminds them that as he's been sent, so he's going to now send them. And he begins to equip them and tell them for what? The first thing is he breathes on them. Now, what is the purpose of that, you ask? Well, breath in the Greek, in the Hebrew, is spirit. Okay, it's spirit. This is where we get into a place of great mystery. Because you see, when Jesus creates Adam in the beginning, or God is in Genesis, leaning over this mound of dirt he's formed into something, what does it say he does? Breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became what? A living soul. A living being. Adam is animated by the breath of life from the Creator, and now the Creator, turned Redeemer, resurrected Lord, is going to breathe life into his disciples. He's going to breathe into them not just a spirit of breath, that is to say, the energy of life that we all breathe, he's going to breathe into them something even more significant. He's going to breathe into them his own energy of life and his own spirit. The spirit of God is going to inhabit them. And now they're going to be equipped to bind on earth that which will be bound in heaven. They're going to be equipped to call and, and, and grow the church. They're going to be equipped to call for people to repent. They're going to carry forward the Elijah message. Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. He didn't get to see him just kind of show up. So the other disciples said, we've seen the Lord, but he said, until I see the nail hands and put my fingers where his nails were and put my hand into his side, I'm not going to believe. So a week later, the disciples were in the house again, and this time Thomas was with them, and the doors were locked. And Jesus came and stood among them and said, Shalom. Sound familiar? Peace be with you. And he doesn't waste any time. Thomas, I've heard you. Check it out. Put your fingers. Put your hand. Stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe. Is that message for you? Is it for me? Stop doubting and believe. What would happen if we stopped doubting and believed? What would happen if we received the breath of the Creator, not just to animate our bodies, but to animate us by the Spirit of God? What would happen out of that? It's pretty amazing. Jesus responds, Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. He got it. He understood. Jesus said, Because you've seen me, you've believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet who've believed. We have to take Thomas's word for it. We have to take this gospel account and, and the record of the appearances of Jesus to the disciples and to others who weren't disciples and the record of Jesus appearing to crowds and the resurrections that took place as Jesus was crucified and what they testified to in this record. We have to take that as our proof. Maybe the proof of the living Christ today is that he's breathed on some of us, that the Spirit is there, that we don't have to doubt but can believe, and that the power of Christ is still somehow available to us beyond the magnificent act of simply saving us. 
Well, we find out what the, the consequence of John and all that's going on there is when we get to Acts. Acts chapter 2, which we just read a few minutes ago, tells us both of the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, but it also tells us of another appearance of Jesus and what he's going to say and what he's going to do. Peter's addressing the crowd post-Pentecost, and he's going to remind people of what Jesus has done. That's what I meant to tell you. That's what I'm, I'm thinking. People of Israel, listen to this. Jesus was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, signs. He did these things, and you, some of you, believed. He was handed over by you to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, along with wicked men, put him to death. But God raised him. Raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. This is what David said about him. I saw the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I won't be shaken. My heart is glad, my tongue rejoices, and my body rests in hope. He will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will he let me see decay, the Holy One said, because you have made known the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Where is that from? Psalm 16, which was our call to worship today. Psalm 16 was our call to worship today. So then Peter makes his case even stronger. The patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is still here. But he was a prophet, and he knew that God had promised what was to come, and he spoke of the resurrection of Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life. We're all witnesses. Now That's an interesting thing, isn't it? We're all witnesses. The group that he's speaking to is not the witness group, and yet we're all witnesses. So let's parse this out two different directions. Peter is referring to those who were actual witnesses gathered at this time of Pentecost, the disciples and all those who witnessed Jesus in the, in, in the flesh, in person after the resurrection. That's primary. But secondary, those who have heard and believe also become witnesses. How are we witnesses? Because we have received the Spirit and with it the power and with that the surety of the truth that He has risen. You are all witnesses. I've lost my place. Thirty-three, exalted to the right hand of God, he's received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit that has poured out what you now see and heard. For David didn't ascend to heaven, yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all Israel be assured God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and others, Brothers, what shall we do? What shall we do? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Spirit. That's what we shall do. What does that passage mean? The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. That's the not yet. We're living in this time in which Jesus, the Messiah, has come, ministered, done his signs and wonders, taught us, crucified, resurrected, has appeared to many, the disciples and many others, is born witness to, has breathed on them that they might receive the Spirit. They've preached, and at Pentecost, the Spirit has come upon 
well, prior to Pentecost, the Spirit has come upon them and they go forth and preach and grow the church by thousands. It's an, it's an amazing sequence. It's an amazing series of events. And now out of this, out of this wondrous thing he's telling them, there's a not yet. Because Jesus, who has experienced all of this and has appeared to them and will go back to heaven and be at the right hand of God, has yet to what? Come again. And we're in that period of the not yet where our faith is tried and where we're called upon to believe though we have not seen. What the passage means is that Jesus is at the right hand of God and he's waiting to all of his enemies are through. Overcome. And he comes in glory to claim his own and resurrect the righteous in Christ and take those with him, the remnant, who have believed. It's about the victory of Christ, not at the cross, not in resurrection, but in the second coming. It's about the victory of God in this thing we call the great controversy, in this big struggle for power, the struggle for your soul and mine. This is why we respond. This is why we must respond with repentance and baptism. For we're buried with Christ in baptism that we might participate in his what? His resurrection. Well, I hope I haven't confused you too terribly much with all of that. But it's Old Testament and New Testament mingled in this passage in Acts in which we find the now and the not yet of faith and belief and what we put our hope in in the resurrection story, the resurrection of Jesus. First Peter, let's just take a quick look over there. First Peter 1, 3 to 9. Forgive me for rereading parts of this, but it's simply magnificent. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. So what is this new birth? Baptism, yes? Right. The new birth that is referring to is built on what we were talking about just a minute ago. The new birth is baptism into his death and resurrection. There's another way of looking at it. You could simply say, as we're born of the flesh the first time, John chapter 3, born of our mothers, born of water, we're born of water the second time, only this time it's water and fire. It's the Spirit. It's into God's life. We're spiritually awakened. We're converted. We're changed. We're born into the faith of Christ. But I like what's said here. We're, we're buried with him and resurrected with him. We're born into this, given new birth into a living hope. It isn't just the death and resurrection. It's the hope that we're born to until the coming salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. That's the now and the not yet. In all of this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. They have come to you so that your faith of worth greater than gold, which perishes, even though refined by the fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you've not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you're receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls, in the now and the not yet. The ultimate salvation of our souls, as it were, comes 
in that great morning when Jesus comes to take us to be with him. That's the consummation. But in the meantime, we're filled with inexpressible joy because of the resurrection life that lives in us in the here and now. And in the now and the not yet. So when we speak of Advent hope, when we speak of faith, what are we talking about? We're talking about coming alive through an act of redemption, moving from a state of being dead in sin to dead in Christ and alive with Christ. We're talking about having the slate wiped clean, about the bath of baptism. We're talking about the new birth of baptism to spiritual life and awareness. We're talking about the presence of the Holy Spirit and the gift of the Comforter to us until that time in which he appears yet again. We're talking about a hope based on eyewitness accounts of a risen Savior. A Savior who not only was resurrected, but resurrected in a glorious body, who knew no boundaries, move in and out of the disciples' presence, and yet was real, physical, alive. A presence that interacted with them, that invited touch, that encouraged them with conversation, that ate with them. Anybody up for some bread and fish? <laughs> Sounds great, doesn't it? Even if you're a vegetarian, you would eat bread and fish with Jesus at the lake, I guarantee it. <laughs> Even if you were vegan, you would eat bread and fish with Jesus at the lake. And you'd love it. You'd love it. If you ever go to Israel, they have a thing called Peter's Fish restaurant right there on the Lake of Galilee. And you can eat the tilapia or whatever it is, the species of fish that lives in the lake there. It's kind of fun. There he is, encouraging his disciples, eating with them, appearing to them, and beginning to teach them again, beginning to instruct them. First of all, peace, don't be afraid, shalom. May the presence of God be with you, and it is, I'm here. And then he says, I'm sent, and so you're sent as my disciples. And what I got to do, you get to do. Now it's yours to share the good news of forgiveness of sin. Now it's yours to tell about resurrection hope. Now it's yours to address the crowds and the masses. Now it's yours to proclaim the good news in the year of the Lord's favor. Now it's yours to invite people to repent and to experience my death and resurrection. Now it's yours to determine, to lock in for eternity those that will be saved and lost. Now it's yours. This is part of what Jesus gives us. This is part of the hope. And then we live in the now and the not yet. Between this time of death and corruption and the day of resurrection and glorification and incorruptibility, when all things will be made new and when we'll live with the Lord forever. It's fantastic, I know. But will you believe? Will you do as Jesus has said and stop doubting and believe? Is it time for you to begin to take on what he's commissioned us to do and to live in this now and not yet with the hope of what's coming, with the reward that is to be? This is what it means, belief now and in the not yet. I hope I haven't done an injustice to Peter or to Acts or to the gospel or even to David, whose word was fulfilled in regards to the Lord. What I hope 
is that we'll stop doubting and believe. That this will become life for us. That this will define our mission once again, our reason for being who we are. That this will animate this body that we might receive the Spirit. That we will pass along what we've received by the one sent as we're sent. And that this hope will fill us with an indescribable joy. No more sadvenist. Lots of gladvenist. But not to trivialize it. If your hope hasn't been grounded in this before, maybe it's time to ground it in the resurrection. As Jesus demonstrated it's possible. And as the apostles witnessed it, and as Paul put it in the center point of his theology, and put it in his eschatology squarely at the second coming of Jesus, this is what it's about. A new life, now and in the not yet. That's the good news. And that's what we've been about historically. That may have been what lit your fire when you became a Christian or an Adventist. That may be something you've forgotten a bit about. But let's let this fill us with an indescribable joy once again. Freely we have received, freely let us give.